I was born in Tehran, so I was in a Muslim school, and I remember learning Quran. And then in 1978, of course, uh, the country turned uh, on its head, and I'm seeing the uprising happening right outside my window, mouth of cocktails being thrown, you know, bullets being fired, and like, you know, it's pretty scary for for a eight, nine-year-old boy. Yeah. Know? These are vivid memories that I have of, you know, they're climbing the walls of the embassy to yeah. get in. It's estimated that close to 200,000 Jews were wow. living in Iran at the time of the Shah. It was it was pretty scary for Jews. Um, there were Jews that were hung, prominent members of, of the Jewish community. There were Jews that were jailed. The thing I remember from that night when my parents told me we're leaving, we go on vacation because yeah. we, we need a break from the revolution. <laughs> They're like, no, we're, we're, we're leaving. Till today, there's a, I mean, estimated between 15,000, 20,000 Jews living in Iran and they're able to put on tefillin and go to shul. I think by the time I got to the States, I was 10. And then I attended public school. At age 17, I kept Shabbos. The first time? The first time. I had a four-year scholarship to CW Post uh, with costs paid and everything, and I gave it up to go to Neve. I, I even went to learn from the Disney Institute. You know, They know how to do customer service so well. Wow. So I, when I investigated, I found that there's a place you can go get trained, the Disney Institute. Just, can I bring this to the school system? Because I'm sitting there with executives from Macy's, Johnson & Johnson, um, Bill Thompson from uh, Johnson & Johnson, Yaakov Sadiq from Hank. <laughs> like, oh, Hank, Incorpor uh, Hank Incorporated. Is, yeah, is that uh, pharmaceuticals? Uh, I said, <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're a yeshiva in, uh, <laughs> in West Hampstead. But, 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 in West Hampstead. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the, that's the dagger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for clicking on this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. We have an amazing guest this week, Rabbi Yaakov Sadiq, all the way from Boca Raton. Previously, before that, he lived in Iran. And in this episode, we speak about what it was like living in Iran, the escape, and the career he now has, the journey. It's really an incredible journey. I'm telling you, besides for the thrilling story of leaving Iran and, and what life was like there, you know, it's back to school time for the kids and maybe you have a child. And Rabbi Sadiq is now a master educator. He knows so, so much. And the lessons here, you know, he trained in Disney Institute because he felt like they have the best customer service. So he he knows what he's doing right now at Cat's Hill Day School in Florida. He's doing an amazing job and you'll hear all about it in this week's episode of the Meaningful People podcast. So listen big. Wanted to give a big welcome and thank you to a new friend of ours. And that is Town Appliance. You know, Town Appliance has been killing it in their business ever since 1979. I was born in 1995. They've been doing amazing work in their industry well before I was here, but we have something in common. You know, Meaningful People is the number one Jewish podcast and Town Appliance is the number one in their industry. Everybody chooses Town Appliance. You're doing a new construction, high-end work. Where do you go? You go to Town Appliance. I should write a jingle for them. I'm really like feeling very like jingly right now, like in a good way. So head to townappliance.com. You can also message them on WhatsApp. I want you to understand something about Town Appliance. They understand the needs of our community. They know not just what you need, but what you want. And they understand how you need it and when you need it. So you're working on that timeline. You know, things can't be done three minutes before Shabbos. Town Appliance understands the Jewish community. They understand what you need, how you need it, when you need it. And that's why so many have been choosing them ever since 1979. And that's why they are our new friends here at Meaningful People. So make sure to head to townappliance.com or message them on WhatsApp. How awesome is that? Send them a message on WhatsApp. Say, hey, listen, heard your ad on Meaningful People. I do need um, new oven, new dishwasher, new whatever in your kitchen, in your house. They are the go-to place. So reach out to them today. Of course, this episode is also sponsored by our friends at Albert and Associates. You know, I was in Moshe's office the other day and he was telling me that someone was just on the phone with him who heard about him on this podcast and they were making such bad decisions with their money that he was literally able to make some tweaks to their plan and save them tens of thousands of dollars each year. It's that simple. And it starts with a free consultation. Just give him a call. Tell him your situation. Set up a meeting. Free consultation. And he could say, hey, listen, I can help you or maybe, maybe I can't help you. But make, to make that phone call, come on, that's a no-brainer. That's 718-644-1594. He could say, hey, listen, this insurance policy you have, you could be doing a lot better for a cheaper price. Or maybe you should be getting this policy, this term, or that. Whatever it is, it starts with calling Moshe Alpert, 718-644-1594. Or email him at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. Moshe can take care of you, especially now you're off season. You want to make sure that you are taking care of with your finances. Moshe is the guy for that. Of course, I wanted to mention a big supporter of Meaningful Minute, 
really quickly, and that is dailygiving.org. You have to understand something. Daily Giving has given out $10.7 million already. They give a dollar a day. They have over 15,300 people giving a dollar a day to Daily Giving. I am a Daily Giver. Everyone in my family is a Daily Giver. Almost everyone I know is a daily giver, but if you are not yet a daily giver, you need to head to dailygiving.org. It is a power of crowdfunding. You have to understand this. I remember when Jonathan Donas started this idea and I was like, wow, like keep going, keep going. This is, I don't know how you're going to get 15,000 people, a hundred thousand, but they have big goals. They want to get a hundred thousand dollars a day donated through daily giving and they will get there. Okay. They are giving $5.5 million a year just by people giving $1 a day. How unbelievable is that? Again, like I said, already $10.7 million distributed and you could be part of that family. Hit the dailygiving.org and become a giver today. And now enjoy this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. So it happens to be the last bunch of episodes we did. I started out the episode the way I don't usually start episodes. I started out by um, being like, welcome, thank you. I'm not that type of guy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like the small talk, casual type of person. So you'll forgive me. I want to just cut cut straight to it. Jump in? <laughs> Jump right in. Um, welcome. Thank you so yeah. much for coming. Thank, oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. You think people want to hear that? <laughs> uh, you grew up in Iran? First of all, Iran or Iran? I you can go either way. How do you like to say it? Um, Iran. Iran. Yeah, yeah. I heard it's it's like yeah. erroneous to say Iran. It's like not. It's not the way to say it. Yeah, people, it's Iranious. Yeah. Oh, very good. <laughs> people do, but uh, I think um, Iran is more. So, um, tell us. I guess tell us about your childhood growing up in Iran. That's different. Yeah, I um, I was born in Tehran. Iran and uh, my father actually was born in Hamadan, which is the burial place of uh, Esther Mordechai till wow. today. It stands there. I uh, visited many times. My father actually grew up uh, three blocks from there until he was 16. He came into Tehran, he joined the army. Um, and when we came into Tehran, so, you know, as it was in many countries, the more you move to the uh, major cities, the less religious people became, unfortunately. So I was in a Muslim school um, wow. until the beginning of third grade. I That's remember, late. That's not like pre one a third grade. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember. Every, I can get around town because I used to bike everywhere. It's pretty safe country, especially when the Shah was there. So, um, so this is pre nineteen eighty. We're talking about nineteen seventy eight, nineteen seventy nine, when the revolution started. Right. So, you know, this is early early 70s is my you know my childhood so um i remember um i was a couple a, minutes before nachis yeah but you like how i know history look at you <laughs> pretty impressed whatever a couple pretty, movies pretty you know? <laughs> we'll see as we go along yeah uh, so i was in a muslim school and i remember learning quran and uh I remember one one day coming home and telling my mom and dad like could you guys get me out of this class like <laughs> what, what what am i doing here like you know i'm learning quran verses you know, we were traditional. We we're not religious, but we were traditional. So, my parents called the school, and um, they gave uh, they gave me a free period. And then the other Jewish school, the other Jewish kids called also. <laughs> you know, uh, helicopter parenting, which we'll talk about maybe. Yeah. Um, and then the other Jewish kids also got a free period. So they they're the Muslims. Kids were like looking outside the window, watching us play soccer and high fiving each other. And like, hey, what's going on over here? How come they have free period? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know that that was the early on years. And then in 1978, of course, um, the country turned um, on its head with a lot of pressure for the Shah to leave. And it's funny, you know, you see this in news clips, and I'm watching this out of my window. You know, we're on a major avenue. Um, like in the Manhattan area, and I'm seeing the uprising happening right outside my window. Molotov cocktails being thrown, you know, bullets being fired, and like you know, it's pretty scary for for a eight nine year old boy. You yeah, know? and for adults. Yeah. Well, what yeah. what was the I guess I have to jog my memory a little bit, but the reason why they were trying to overthrow the Shah was it a bunch of young rebellious Muslims that were trying to reform yeah. the country? It's a good question. I, look, I think the Shah for sure was good to the Jews. We'll leave it, oh, at, yeah? we'll leave it okay. at that. Yeah, I mean, the, tie, the Shah is very close ties to, um, to the Jewish community. 
Um, but if I can say so, I'm, I'm no historian, but the Shah made some mistakes. You know, uh, Tehran was like the Paris of the Middle East, contrary to movies such as Not Without My Daughter, where you see donkeys in the streets and sheep. Yeah. That, that was not the case. You know, <laughs> Tehran was uh, very modern. Uh, in fact, I remember on our second floor, uh, there were these Americans who were studying at the uni University of Tehran. So um, there's a pretty, you know, um, on the map kind of city. But if you drove, if you drove about 100, 150 miles out, there are people who didn't have running water, and there were no hospitals, and and you know that the hotbed, and, and you know, where where revolutions begin is when you don't take care of the poor. And, yeah. And and the Shah ignored a lot of internal issues, which I think uh, caught up with him. So, um, it, and it became. Um, unbearable at that point he had to leave the country and it was a pretty sad day you know on that day when he left the country and, and I think the day that around the same time that he left the country the US uh, the US embassy also fled or the Canadian embassy so so they you know again these are vivid memories that I have of you know they're climbing the walls of the embassy to yeah. get in you know and you've seen you know you've seen it in the movies a lot of it is Hollywood a lot of it is it is is true um, you know, and they took over the embassy for a long time. And uh, isn't it funny that the day Ronald Reagan gets sworn in, surprise, surprise, <laughs> you know, the hostage, hostages are let go. Yeah. They, they were not messing with Ronald Reagan. So, uh, but uh, that, that whole hostage situation was, was stuff I was watching every day. But know? up until that yeah. point where Iran kind of went AWOL, it was, you know, a regular fine place for a young from boy and family. I mean, you weren't religious then, yeah. but for a Jewish family to grow up, how many Jews uh, were yeah. growing up there? It's estimated that close to 200,000 Jews were wow. living in Iran at the time of the Shah. Spread out, you know, main, main cities like Shiraz and Esfahan and, you know, uh, it, Ter it, it Tehran. It me like New York terms. Like, is yeah. it like five towns to Brooklyn? <laughs> like, what's... I mean, there are cities that are 100 miles apart and there are cities that are closer. Um... You know, interestingly enough, where Esther and Mordechai are buried is not Shushan, even though people call it Shushan. Capital was Shush, which is Susa. Uh, it's 120 miles south of Hamadan, wh where where the Kever is. Um, but you know, people just keep referring to it as Shushan. <laughs> but um, why not? We're just doing it yeah, wrong. That's yeah, that's fine. I, I, I go along with it. Um, but uh, Simchas Pirim. Yeah, <laughs> Simchas Shushan Pirim. That, that that city had a lot Shush. of Jews. You know, Hamadan had a lot of Jewish Shiraz. Uh, the Shirazis are very religious. They they somehow kept their religion, and then of course you have the Mashadis. is a whole whole story in itself. You know, they they called they called the Persian Muranos, and you know they were they're being converted. You know, and they stayed strong. So the, there's so many different cities and nuances and minhagim kind of like you yeah. know that came out of Iran. But you know, at that time in in seventy eight seventy nine, I was looking outside my window and. I was seeing some wild stuff, you know. I was seeing sandbags being made, and you know, I would hit. My mother got injured in in in, in a, just like a rally that just started out of nowhere, so she was like in the hospital for a little bit. Scary stuff for a, for a little kid, as you said, even for adults, right? Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really. But you had mentioned that you were in class with Muslims. Yeah. And um, I think for anyone growing up in my in my time, it's hard to understand, like. Were they friendly to you? Were you yeah. guys like yeah. just, hey cousin? <laughs> you know, like yeah. what, what was it like? They pretty much were. Interesting thing about Iran is, and and I'm not, you know, justifying this and not saying that there's some under underlining tone of anti-Semitism there, of course. But as long as you kind of like don't mention Israel and Zionism, till today there's a, I mean, estimated between fifteen thousand twenty thousand Jews living in Iran, and they're able to put on tefillin and go to shul. As long as you don't associate with Israel or, or any 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 type of Zionistic, you know, ideals. So, um, my experiences were not bad. Yeah, they're pretty much friendly to me. And that's quite the exodus, though, from two hundred thousand down to the numbers that you just cited. Yeah. Where, if you know, where predominantly did the Iranian community flee to? Yeah, two major, uh, uh, two major states: New York and California. You know, California is called Terangelis, you know. <laughs> they like the weather there. It's more similar to Tehran and, um, you know, a huge community in, in, in L.A. and other places of California. And then New York, you know. So we fled to uh, Athens uh, in Greece. And from Athens, we got a visa to Israel. And from then, from Israel to the United States. 
where I, um, you know, attend the public school. The thing I remember from that night when my parents told me we're leaving, I was like, all right, you know, uh, are we going on vacation? Because we need need a break from the revolution. (laughs) They're like, no, we're we're, we're leaving. And and I remember going to my bedroom, knowing that we couldn't take so much stuff with us because it would be suspicious. And, and I was trying to figure out what do I put in my bag? You know, what do I take with myself? Is it my coin collection? Is it, you know, some special awards I got? Like that, that moment of trying to figure out what you fit in a knapsack. Mm, that's deep. Knowing, not, knowing you're not coming back. I'll never forget that night. I, I remember that vividly. You were 10, year, 10 years old when that happened? Yeah, so by then, nine turning 10, yeah. right, ran out of time. I think by the time I got to the States, I was 10. Um, and I attended public school because I don't really know any better. Right. Yeah. I want to take you back, though, to that. Yeah, sure. Those conditions that led to that decision on the part of your parents yeah. to have the family pack up a bag and flee, not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. If you can sort of take us into that into that mindset of what was going on, were you aware that there were discussions uh, of running, or did it just come th- that night? What was the what, what were the conditions in the home? Yeah, people were panicking each other. You know, all, all the Jews were talking. I was pulled in today. I was interrogated. You know, my father worked for a prominent firm. You know, of a lot of Jews, and he was questioned about certain things. And, you know, we know Jewish, Jewish history well. <laughs> so it wasn't looking good. Um, you could say in the back of my parents' minds, they thought maybe somehow we'll come back one day, but I certainly didn't see it based on what I was seeing outside. <laughs> you know, so I think that, you know, as parents, you want to protect your kids. It's me and my sister. My sister was four. And, um, you know, based on the trajectory of how things were unfolding, it was it was pretty scary for Jews. Um, there were Jews that were hung, prominent members of of the Jewish community. There were Jews that were jailed. So for well, for no other reason than they could find any reason, you know, just um, made up stories that you're connected to Israel or um, you were close to the Shah or you know the regime, you know. So I I, I think as as a good father and a mother, I think they made that decision that this this is this is one of those times where we got to go. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Do Do you know um, how your parents ended up in Iran? Did they grow? Did they grow up there? Because yeah, we, we, yeah. I always like think like, how does how does like how that happen? <laughs> like how they live yeah. there, and and you mentioned yeah. that maybe they thought they'd go back. I, I guess it was home for them. Like they uh, really loved it. Iranians are very passionate about Iran. You know, they're very patriotic, and the music, and the food, and the culture, and that an allegiance to the Shah. Again, I'm not. Judging whether Shah was righteous was not righteous is not for me to make those decisions because I don't know, you know, his dealings with with his people outside of how he dealt with the Jews. So, but you just love that country, you know, particularly because he was good to the Jews. It was safe. Um, you know, it was a country that was on the move in the Middle East. Again, I, I called it the Paris of the Middle East. So um, we go pretty back. I mean, uh, when we we you know we we checked into our genealogy and it, it goes way back i mean the fact that they grew up in hamadan which is where esther and mordechai are buried and my great grandparents go back there this is actually a picture of you yeah yeah, yeah. this Thank is you a pic- for bringing this into the studio was, I, I promise you i thought this was an ipad <laughs> it's, a, it's a picture frame yeah. so this is your i'm about two two and a half years old and i'm standing right in front of the kever of esther and mordechai in hamadan hmm. uh, my father grew up three blocks from there until he was 16, and we used to wow. go back all the time to visit. Uh, if you could YouTube it, all the things you see I remember, there's a little short door, a stone door to get in because they wanted you to come in like in respect that you bow coming in. I remember I was short, so I walked right <laughs> in, but I remember my parents behind me having to bow <laughs> to get in. So if you, if you YouTube it, you'll, you'll see a whole tour. It looks like a pretty prominent caver. Yeah, yeah. With the yeah, fabulous yeah. Hamantash window. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> Almost there. It's, again, it's interesting. The Iranians are careful not to, and there was an incident there a couple of years ago, which wasn't simple, but they're careful not to like destroy um, Kivar Tzadikim, you know, um, and things like that. Are so, there any other um, yeah. Gedalim yeah, being buried da- in Iran? Daniel is ben- buried in Iran and Chavakuk, so <sighs> two other. Yeah, yeah. Not many people can say yeah. that they've visited the cave of Esther and Mordechai. Yeah, 
yeah I, I remember lighting candles there you know people crying yeah do you remember the last time that you visited yeah yeah i remember my, my last time was probably when i was seven yeah you didn't know it would be your last no time. no never did i think that would be the last time no no so you're in your room you're packing a bag you're putting in your coin collection yeah interesting choice you know yeah you may, may want to brought some clothing <laughs> <laughs> you're putting in some coins yeah um because that's not gonna be suspicious when there's a bunch of things clinking around in your bag <laughs> Yeah, they they weren't like the Shaw's gold coins. Yeah. they were just my my. But own. but so so um, yeah. your you your sister your parents pick up and where where do you go? So we went to Athens. Um, mm -hmm. You're able to get out of the country, no problem. Yeah, because again, we we didn't draw any attention to us. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, it got very hard. You know, my Please. relatives afterwards. Those are the stories, like over mountains and camels and donkeys and like you know, having to cross borders. And th thank God, we we again, my father had that instinct to just get out of there. So from Athens, we got a visa to go to Israel. Uh, we spent four months in Cholon. Um, One second, I think we yeah. missed the story about the camels and the mountains. Yeah, so th those 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 people about about a few months after that, that you could no longer get out um, by plane, and they were going through all sorts of borders through Pakistan and and uh, you know um, they're being smuggled out and and you know spending time in all these places through through caravans and you know. Thank God we, 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 uh, your parents had the foresight of getting yeah, out a little yeah, earlier. Yeah. Just, we just got well, out. Wow. Are other people still yeah. stuck there today? Yeah. So I wouldn't say stuck. Um, it's hard to estimate. They say between 15,000 and 20,000 Iranians still there. Are they, yeah. do they want to be there? So you know what? A lot of them do. I think they feel financially it wouldn't make it anywhere else because of the exchange rate. And, you know, yeah. I think, you know, some of them, if they, f if they sell their homes, they can buy a bicycle, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating, but, um, and again, there's something about the culture that they love, you know? So I think if they really wanted to, they could get out, but um, a lot of them want to stay there. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. 15,000 Jews there, there now from, from community or not? A, a lot of them becoming from her, yeah. I, I uh, was in touch with, with a couple of schools there that needed some advice with curriculum and things like that. I was like, uh, this, they said, yeah, the government's fine with it. As long as we run all the curriculum by them, they have no issues with us teaching Torah as long as... Uh, as long as they approve it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was on a couple of Zoom calls with them, which was really cool. You know? It's so interesting to compare the life that I myself live and people here in New York versus people who are living willingly today in Iran. It's like we have all the freedom in the world here and, and, yeah. and there they're having to get their curriculum uh yeah. approved by the iranian government like yeah. it's it's hard to imagine They're totally not it's it's not the way it was when the shah was it's all the restrictions i, I don't want to you know paint yeah. a peachy picture that you know that it's it's all all great but you know for the ones who are choosing to live there making you know, it work they're making it work yeah so athens then to israel Cologne. yeah how'd that go uh not so great you know, uh, Persians were not so popular in Israel at that time. Oh, really? Parsi, Parsi, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know, it wasn't going so well in school, but I knew it was temporary because the aim was to get to the States. And um, when we got to America, so the closest school in Kew Gardens was PS99. So my, my parents registered me there, and a guy by the name of Stephen Hurtis, who I recently co connected with years later, since uh, fourth grade. <laughs> Unbelievable how I found him. I think he's from now, and we made up. To, we made up to meet, because again, you don't you don't forget kindness. Yeah, he was so kind to me. He took to me. The funny thing was, he was a classmate of yours. No, mm -hmm. Stephen Hurtis was the teacher oh. at PS Nine Nine, a Jew. Okay, and he brings me to the front of the class, and he says, "Boys and girls, we have a new student from Iran." I was like, "Do you not know that these <laughs> kids are going home at night and watching people climbing walls yeah. at the embassy?" So, you know, I got to flex though that yeah. <laughs> you're like here is a student from Iran yeah. and watching that on the yeah. TV and you're like yeah. so he's a great guy and I love him. He he took really good care of me, but that announcement, you know, <laughs> uh, I think got me beaten up a little bit. Um, you know, I, again, you, I Iran was the enemy back then. They're holding hostages. Um, of 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 the US. Holding right. hostages, you know. They, yeah, so. so what what was the kindness that you remember? Kindness was he checked in with me, he put me in the ESL. I'd never seen ABC, never seen the Olive Base. I, I had not a talk, I was using sign language. <laughs> 
um, you know, and, I'm, and I'm thrown into, <laughs> and I'm thrown into a fourth grade class in a, in a public school. You know, so he just uh, checked in with me when I got in, checked in with me when I left, and uh, see how you remember a teacher. Yeah, years later. Uh, so it's probably decades uh, later. Un unreal. And we're gonna get together. You know, we we, we that's we, so nice. We recently connected. Where do you yeah. find him like, on Facebook? <laughs> um, his his uh, son and daughter in law had what to do with Hank, where I worked, yeah. and I said there are not too many herdesses out there. Is your father and father-in-law Stephen Hurtis? They go, how do you know him? I go, how do I know him? <laughs> wow. He's my first teacher in America, you know, so that's how I connected with him. And, um, you know, so what happened was, you know, my father went from being this big executive, you know, I remember his corner office and spending time in there to like, you know, not knowing the language and not having a job. But he was handy and he's a survivor, my dad. We call him Bubba the Builder. As in Bob the Builder, Bubba means <laughs> Bubba means father. My kids call him Bubba the Builder. He he could build a whole house. Like he, really? yeah, yeah, I, I can't. I have two left hands. He, he can, yeah. so because he was handy, he saw an ad for um, that they're looking for someone on the assembly line at Armatron to fix watches and, and assemble watches. So he meets this guy named Moshe Gantz. who was as a doctor. Today's in Safras, who at that time worked at Armatron. He was getting watches from Eugene Gluck, the famous Eugene Gluck. Ellie Rowe just mentioned them. Eugene yeah, Gluck. And I said yeah, that yeah, Edgar yeah. Gluck and Eugene Gluck are yeah. the same people, yeah. but they're not. Yeah. <laughs> so there's my father on the assembly line for minimum wage, which was uh, three dollars at that time, whatever it was, putting together watches because he's very handy. Yeah. And one day Moshe again says, "Eli, you know, I never asked you. Like, where do your kids go to school?" He's like, "Ah, oh, great school right around the corner, PS ninety nine. He goes, "What? No, no, no." <laughs> He's like, this is America. We, do, we don't do this stuff. He goes, well, what am I doing wrong? He goes, no, no, he's got to go to yeshiva. So through through his efforts, um, Moshe helped me get into a local yeshiva in, in Kew Gardens, which they were wonderful to me. They were great. They were welcoming. But it was a, um, you know, it was a yeshiva yeshiva, you know, a mainstream yeshiva that wasn't so prepared for taking on Baal Shuva kids. So I was sitting in first grade, for Judaic studies and in in, in, fifth, in, in, in fifth grade right. for, ge for for general studies, so they had to bring a special chair for me because I wouldn't fit in the first grade chairs. So there I was with like, you know, looking around <laughs> with these first graders here. <laughs> so again, it was it was a good start, but then I ended up at Ezra, the, the amazing Ezra Academy of wow. Queens under the leadership of Rabbi Eli, Eli Freilich, who who is known as the father of Kirif here in America, and somehow I ended up in someone's shit that I think you may have heard of. I think you may have heard of Rabbi Moshe Weinberger. Yeah. <laughs> so I end up in his shir for four years. I mean, it's an all-star cast, Rabbi Zalman Dax, Rabbi Moshe Zucker. I don't know how Rabbi Ferlach put them together. Like he had an all-star cast of people who know how to deal with care of people. So that was it. Once I wow. ended up at Ezra, my journey just took off. At age 17, I kept Shabbos. For the first time? For the first time. We'll be right back to this episode of the podcast. I wanted to tell you about our friends at Collars & Co. You know, Yontif is right around the corner and you want to make sure you get your shirts in time. So you want to order them right now. Pull that car over, pause this YouTube video, head to collarsandco.com and select your favorite shirt to wear Yontif. My favorite happens to be the Quadruplex shirt. It is a full white button down shirt. It is super comfortable, looks amazing. It looks amazing. And for this time of year, you're in shul for a very long time, diving your eyes out, your brains out, which is amazing. But you want to feel comfortable. You want to feel good. All things got to be going your way. And that's why you need to shop at collarsandco.com. Right now, you can use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off your order. That is collarsandco.com. That's all I wear. And if I'm wearing a collar, it's from collarsandco.com. Right now, I happen to be not wearing a collar. But if I were wearing a collar, it's from collarsandco.com. And don't get it confused that they just have collars. They have shirts, obviously, full shirts, amazing shirts, some polos, some long sleeves, long button down, but get your hands on collars on the code.com. I know so many of you have ordered from them already and you're ordering for your second and third time just to get more and more shirts. They are amazing, amazing product. So go to collars and and make sure to order it today. And of course, I want to give a big thank you to our friends at OK Clarity for sponsoring this episode. It's a beautiful time of year. And you know, Yumta season is right around the corner. Lots of family time is coming up. And while this is a meaningful time, for many of us, it also brings up a lot of pain and struggle for some people. Many people might find themselves crumbling under the pressure of Yomta season, while others may just dread the person they become when they're surrounded by certain family members. You know, it's a really common thing that we can regress to a less healthy version of ourselves when we go back to our childhood homes 
or the like. If any of this struggle rings a bell for you, I want to assure you that you are not alone. I want you to find the support you need and deserve, and I want you to go to okclarity.com. Whether you need a therapist, nutritionist, coach, or all the above, you will find that special someone who will support you in becoming the healthiest, happiest, and most healed version of yourself on okclarity.com. Okclarity.com is the upscale version of ZocDoc for the Jewish world. It is the place for any Jew to find a top-notch therapist, psychiatrist, nutritionist, or coach, and it's completely free to use. Every professional on okclarity.com is experienced in working with the Jewish community, so they truly get it. You don't have to explain what Shabbos, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or what Sukkot is. They understand. They get it and more. What I love about okclarity.com is how easy it is to use a directory to find the type of professional that you're looking for. And you even can complete a short survey and they'll suggest matches for you. They have dozens of providers who take insurance and you go watch an intro video of each professional to get a better sense of who they are before taking that first step to reach out, which I get. It's hard to take that first step but it's so worth it. You'll thank me later. Seriously, people have reached out to me and thank me for letting them know about okclarity.com. It is an amazing, amazing place. And they have an awesome WhatsApp community as well, which I am part of. I was just scrolling through their Instagram page and I was blown away by the amount of amazing content they have. They legit host Instagram live sessions every weeknight where different experts come on to discuss pressing mental health and wellness topics and answer community questions anonymously and for free. So if you're not already following OK Clarity on Instagram, you definitely want to do that. Side note, if you are listening to this and you are a wellness professional and you're not already on OKClarity.com, here's your friendly reminder that this is the place that you want to be if you want to stay relevant to help the people that need you. So make sure if you're a professional therapist, coach, psychiatrist, nutritionist, whatever it may be, that you head to OKClarity.com and you get on their website. Now back to this episode. So at what point did you did you and your family become religious? Yeah, so... Um, look again, Ezra Academy. Yeah, I'm going to give them credit for it. Um, I think, you know, being in someone like Rabbi Shweimugas Shear, just through osmosis, like you know, you just sit there, and, and and people cannot believe the access that we had to him. Like you can't get him for five minutes right now. Yeah. So we had him for Gemara, and then we had him in the lunchroom and in the hallway. It was a young Rabbi Shweimugas. Yeah, yeah. I have some pictures that I've threatened that I would show. You know, <laughs> I keep threatening him that I'm going to pull up some pictures. Um, so, you know, he, he just, you know, he's this un, unbelievable guy who just brought himself down to our level. You know, he would take off his long coat and, and play stickball with us. And, um, you know, we'd have to come every day with a, a huge bag of um, tennis balls because he would lose all of them. Uh, <laughs> lose them because he was good. Yeah, he would roof them over, over the lake. You know, and then when we play softball, he lost all the softballs, and and who could guard him in basketball? You can't even. Guard you know what they say, you know, about the Rebbe and you know the uh, and the yeshiva. The Lakers were scouting him, but yeah. he 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 messed up his knee. <laughs> you know, like that's like the talk about the Rebbe and we're good at ball. So you have a guy with his pace flapping, yeah, playing stickball with us, hitting hitting the ball four miles. How do you not become religious? How do you not? listen to his own personal stories growing up in Kew Garden Hills and YCQ. And like, I, I was a principal at YCQ and he went to YCQ, like, you know. So yeah. the fact that he was able to, you know, story after story from Baal Shem Tov and, you know, Mizuchi Maggit and, you know, the older of Cooks and, and Marals and they kind of like sink. And it's that word from the Kutzker, where you had from my Allah it, it it stayed on the heart until it became so heavy and it punctured the heart. At 17, it punctured my heart. You know? But so it's, I guess you're, it's, it's a privilege. You're, it's so interesting that your introduction to really from kite was laced with um, Hasidus. Yeah. And for yeah. many, that's not the case. For many, it's like, yeah. you know, very yeah. soft introduction to concepts and, and stuff. But that, that's really incredible. It, it was for sure the Hasidus. Absolutely. The stories, the Hasidus, the the kumzitzes, the, 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 like we, we'd be learning Gemara and he'd, he'd like stop and sing a nigan, you know? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you like, you know? And then in the afternoon we had him again for like Jewish philosophy, Jewish history. So we had a deal that, you know, we'd, we'd get the work done, but then we'd go back to the morals and all the <laughs> other stuff. So the, the principles would come in, we knew to put away the, you know, to put away the, the, the Jewish books and, and take I, out. I think know. it's not uh, coincidental. Your your Sharish Hanashama yeah. comes from Iran, yeah. where the Purim story yeah. occurred. You mentioned the Kfarim of Mordechai Atzadik and Esther Amalka, and Purim we know is the root of of Hester yeah. and the hidden Torah and the Panimiyasa Torah. 
and that chesidus and the, the the light that the Baal Shem Tov revealed that that's what brought your neshama back, I, I think is is uncoincidental. A hundred percent. I want to make it clear. He taught us the history. We we got like great <laughs> grades and on on the regions yeah. and all that because he was so bright and he knew how to do it. But when we got done with the history, then it was back to like maral and <laughs> and it, it, I believe Rabbi Moshe Weinberger <laughs> stopped in Ezra Academy was after he was a Rebbe in Shar Torah. No. I'm not sure tour, but he was someplace else before yeah, as Queens. academy in Queens, and um, w- thank thank God, you know, th- there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people out there who are married with great kids, who are Ezra kids. Like Great Nick has such a huge presence of Ezra students. And then what happened was, I went back to teach at Ezra, and here I went from his Talmud to his colleague, which was so weird. Oh, so he was uh, he, he was there while he was still he- there. Yeah, that story is funny. I was in Charyosh of learning in uh, Rav Shamut or Rav Yeager's year, and Rabbi Ferrell calls me up on a payphone. There is a time that we had payphones. Yeah. Know. Kid, kids don't know what that is. Um, so <laughs> the Bachram called me to go, Rabbi Ferrell's on the phone for you. I go, oh, Rabbi Ferrell, yeah. So I get on the phone, he goes, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, um, I, I'm in, I'm in Shir, in Shari Yashav. He goes, I need you, I need you at Ezra. I go, Rabbi, I, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll stop for you, no problem. He goes, no, I need you from tomorrow and onwards. And I think I dropped a phone because <laughs> I was 23 years old, just a couple years older than the high school kids. And he was gonna put me in a 10th grade classroom. What, what, what had happened was one of the Rebbeim there, his father who ran a nursing home, I believe that was a story, you know, he had to go and help his father and he left like right in November. So there I was in 10th grade teaching these kids that, you know, just a few years ago, I was sitting in those seats. Mm-hmm. So you're saying this strong pull into the nursing home industry is not a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened was it was the greatest thing in the world because Ezra was a, was a laboratory for me, familiar. I know I know what, what the mission is, just love the kids and of course teach them, but continue to, to just like, you know, inspire them. You're so young. Yeah. 23, you're teaching 20, 20, 10th Not married, graders. single. And uh, I did the same things. I just mimicked what, what my Rebbeim did. We started this year with Nigan. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, I, an, an, an Iranian one? Or? No, no, no. Although I do know them. I used to, I'm a big card collector. I used to bring my baseball cards and, and hand that out. You know, every time I got a Reggie Jackson, you know, I would pass it around. And that's how we started Cheer. I played ball with them, just like my, my Rebbeim played ball with me. I pretty much, yeah, I was pretty good. I kept up with them. I mean, they were they were in shape. I wasn't at that time. But uh, <laughs> again, playing ball, telling, telling Baal Shem Tov stories, bringing him to my house for Shabbos, you know, Thursday night, comes uh, this. To your house with your with your parents? Uh, with my parents, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is so unique. Yeah. My parents, it was a little, a little weird. So like we wanted you to become a doctor type or your parents were thrilled that, my, oh. my parents were the typical Iranian parents who wanted me to be a Which I have no idea what those are. Oh, yeah, yeah, Iranian yeah. parents want their kids to be doctors? Yeah, old Jews, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Iranians are a little bit harsher about it, you know. They, they make it more known. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was that was a tough thing for my parents. That it, it was re- Look, now, now they have a lot of nachas. They see me speaking here, speaking there, um, doing great things and, and they have nachas, but I ask Mechila all the time. It's very hard for them. Really, really, really hard for them. Um, and I, I, I thank them all the time. And, and, and I ask a lot of Mechila. The fact that you went to Chinuch? Yeah, yeah. I had, I had a four-year scholarship to CW Post at that time uh, with costs paid and everything. And I gave it up to go to Neve. So um, my, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in, the, yeah, in, in, yeah, in, in this yeah, room yeah. over here. So you could not console my mom. I mean, that, that was just like, you know, that was tough. That was tough. And I called CW Post. I said, I'll be back in a year. They go, defer, yeah. yeah, they go, uh, sir, you know, we're giving you a four-year scholarship. We don't make deals over here. <laughs> uh, you, you're deferring, you're losing it. So that, that was so a you, tough. So you lost it. Like I, you I made the decision that uh, you yeah. must have been really firm and confident with the decision yeah. you were making if you were willing to forego what is hundreds of thousands of dollars in free education. Yeah. I started late. I, I started Queens College for a semester. I didn't go with the twelfth graders, and I joined, you know, a year younger than me, twelfth graders going from Ezra because I just so depressed at Queens. I said, "I'm going from Ezra Queens," you know, I'm looking at Kylie Hall and all, like this place, like has thousands of kids, and where, where's the Kumsitz? Where's the where's the Mices? Where's the so um, through the help of Ezra, they they got me to go to Neve. I spent two years in Neve, two years in Tomo. I was the first Neve boy to go to Tomo, which was revolutionary. First Iranian to go to Tomo? 
first time hearing to go to Omo, I think. And uh, Remechel Shurkin, who was my first uh, year Rebbe, was very kind. He uh, curbed the Yiddish a lot, uh, so I could understand this year. Nice. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, two years in Tomo, and then I came back to Shar Yoshev, and then that's when Rabbi Freyach made the call. He said, I need you tomorrow, and then that was it. And from then I became assistant principal at um, YCQ, and um, then then Hank, you know, had a school there, and, and then ended up at, uh, ended up in Florida somehow, you know. When, uh, when, uh, when you were in the Neve and, and Tomo, I I gather that's at a time where communication with America wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. Yeah. And well, for most of us today, it's it's way simpler than for you because you don't have WhatsApp. Very deep. But I'm just. <laughs> no, no. T- today it's <laughs> Israel's like uh, yeah. you're across the street. At a time where you're making that drastic of a decision to forego yeah. the scholarship, to forego that trajectory, yeah. and to go decide to to really devote yourself to furthering your learning and your Yiddishkeit education, what kind of impact did that have on your relationship with your parents? Again, it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough. They 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 wanted to be supportive, but they were having a very hard time with it. And I'll tell you what else didn't help. That was the Gulf War, you know, and my father's watching CNN and, and, and watching like, you know, rockets coming into Israel. And, you know, he's like, we escaped, we escaped Iran, yeah, not to like, put you, you know, in danger. And yeah. he wanted to come on the first plane and take me back. And I begged him, I said, Dad, let me stay here. We're, we're okay. You know, Yushalayim is a safe place, even though Neve is a little bit out, out of Yushalayim. And again, I, I give them so much credit because I don't, I don't know if I would be able to do it. And I'll never forget, my mother said, you'll have children one day, you'll see. Mm. And then when I was sending my kids to Israel, you know, with with five kids, can I know, they went different times. There were times that there was wars going on, you know, and, and things weren't so great at Gaza and, you know, uh, the West Bank. And I was like, wow, I remember my mom. She was right. Mm-hmm. She was, I appreciate it even more that now as a father, I see how hard that, how hard that was, you know. That was crazy. The gift of perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really uh, yeah, again, I, I appreciate them. I really do. So mm-hmm. you went from really in this story so far, being a young kid growing up in Iran, not religious, to an assistant principal at YCQ and then, you know, head of school and and at Hank and mm-hmm. and now you're master of Chinuch and Boca. Thank you. Did that, like, was there any intense formal training in education or just something that, you again, you picked up in the classroom at yeah. Ezra Academy and, yeah. and you... It's a great question, Achi. I think a little bit of both. I did all my formal trainings. I have two masters. I have masters in... Uh, regular ed and special ed and school building sh- leadership because I, f- I, f- I felt that you have to do it. Yeah. There's a lot, you know, th- there's a lot that I picked up there. But I was a sponge. I was just always reading and learning and following the people who I thought had it, you know, had the secret sauce. And of course, watching the, the crew at Ezra alone was like a head start, you know. So, you know, people know this about me because like in the last few years, it, it became such a thing because I started talking about it. I even went to learn from the Disney Institute, you know. The story goes that, you know, we were walking around in Magic Kingdom and all you do is walk. You yeah, know, right. These trips, you know. A lot of walking. Yeah. My kids are older now, so I'm Potter. If I want to go, I go by myself. <laughs> so uh, we're exhausted. And we were by a lagoon somewhere over there by the water. And I went to get what I knew was kosher, was the premium uh, Mickey bars, the ice cream bars. So I, I bought for everybody and I gave it out. For $47. Uh, maybe a little less. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, a seagull came, swooped in, and grabbed my daughter Ayelet's ice cream. Oh, I thought you were going to say she swiped Ayelet. No, like, oh my no, gosh. No. And the soundtrack got really loud. Yeah, yeah. I think you heard her in Epcot. Yeah, that's how much she screamed. <laughs> so I'm going back to the kiosk and I'm thinking to myself, like, as you said, they're $47 in ice cream. I'm wearing a keeper. Do I like ask for another one and say, hey, it was your seagull. Like, what do I, you know. You could finance it, you know? probably. <laughs> so, and I said, ah, I'm not gonna make a chal Hashem. I'll just get another one, I'll pay for another one. I was, I was reaching for my pocket to pay for another one. So the guy at the kiosk pulls out another ice cream. He says, sir, here you go. I saw what happened, Walt stuff. He said, your, your, daughter, has a, your daughter has another great story to tell when she goes back home. I got back to the benches. I said, I gotta figure out what is the secret of these people that they know how to do customer service so well. Wow. So uh, when I investigated, I found there's a place you can go get trained, the Disney Institute. And I did all their courses. And my um, 
my theory um, hypothesis was, can I bring this to the school system? Because I'm sitting there with executives from Macy's, Johnson and Johnson, you know, Philip Morris, and, and and funny, the first time I was there, they're going around the room, and this guy says, I'm so and so from Macy's, 34th Street in Manhattan. <laughs> Um, Bill Thompson from uh, Johnson and Johnson, Yaakov Sadiq from Hank. <laughs> and like, oh, Hank, Incorpor- uh, is, Hank Incorporated. Yeah, is that uh, pharmaceuticals? Uh, I said, <laughs> no, we're 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 a yeshiva in, uh, <laughs> in West Hampstead. But, 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 in West Hampstead, <laughs> yeah. I think that's the that's the dagger. Yeah. yeah. So um, so they go, they couldn't understand why I was there. So what I found is, I'm looking around and saying, why are you guys here? You guys are from great companies, you know, just up there with Disney. I found that they came to find out something that Disney had, had figured out. And that was that in the last couple of decades, maybe a little bit more, the world had moved from an industrial economy to an experiential economy. That, you know, if my father's coffee was the same temperature, tasted the same on his way to the subway, grabbing it from the cart, he's good to go. He doesn't need to romance his coffee. But, you know, you have Howard Schultz goes to Milan and, you know, the famous story, and that's how Starbucks started. And he wants a cup of coffee before his meeting. And they took him into a place where there's steam and presses and vests and baristas. He goes, what is this? He goes, and they say, Howard, this is, this is coffee. This is our coffee houses. It's the third place between work and home. It's where, we, it's where, where synergy happens. It's where we collaborate. And they use the word romance. Coffee for us is a romance. He came back and they wanted to institutionalize them because they thought he was crazy. And, and he almost like he almost um, broke off with them over this. This became a huge point of contention if you read his books, which are phenomenal. From the ground up, he has a lot of books. So now you, have, you, know, you can't walk half a block without hitting a Starbucks yeah. because we started wanting an experience, not just a great product. You know, I, I bought these glasses from Warby Parker. They haven't stopped emailing me since I got it. <laughs> <laughs> How's it fitting? Do you need to come in? Do you want us to clean it? What's your experience like? Can you take a survey? Like if my father would get, he's like, how do I block these guys? <laughs> I, I don't want to hear from them. Why are you bothering me? I, yeah, the glasses are great. You know, so you know, in Florida, I was walking, and, and I walked by. I, I walked by. Um, I walked by a bank, and and there's a coffee shop in the bank, and me being out of the box, corporate, you know, corporate mind thinking, I walked in. I said, "Can I ask why there's a co- Why is there? A co- why is there a coffee? St- What's going on over here?" So they said that um, you know, this is this is our way of making the experience wonderful for our people who come in and are having a tough time with a seven and a quarter interest rate and maybe not making their bills this month and kind of like hoping somehow money got in there, yeah. you know, when they check their account. Go ahead, go have a latte, sit down, have, have, a, have a big chocolate chip cookie. So the world became more of an experiential economy. And um, so I wanted to see if that would work in school. And, and it's been remarkable. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. A quick message from our friends at 10 Yacht. You know, the time of engagement should be the happiest time in a college life. Yet the lack of resources to pay for a beautiful beginning can turn a dream into a big stress. 10 Yacht is an organization that is established to ease the family's burden so that nothing gets in the way of Akala assuming her exalted role in the chain of Jewish history. When you support Ten Yad, you are part of this everlasting chain, part of the pillars supporting the eternal Binyan Adeyad that will usher in the days of Mashiach immediately. When a bride turns to Ten Yad for help, she is treated with the utmost respect and serviced in absolute discretion. Ten Yad helps Kalas in various ways. They have a beautiful gown showroom in New York from which they lend out stunning dresses and bridal accessories to brides at no cost. They also provide a home starter package that contains many essentials that new couples can use to set up their home. It is set up as an elegant boutique in which the Kala can shop for her household needs, selecting from the many designs and styles elegantly displayed on their shelves. A Kala on her wedding day is compared to a queen. And Ten Yad helps her walk down the aisle feeling like royalty. Ten Yad's annual auction fundraiser is live right now. As you're listening to this, you can go and start buying your tickets. You can choose from an array of luxury, a Cartier watch, a Tesla, thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, vacation, silver, and more. It's a win-win. Win luxury prizes while helping young couples build their homes in the most dignified way. Buy your tickets right now at tenyad.org and watch their phenomenal show on October 29th. Now back to this episode. First of all, it's really incredible yeah. um, that you went through that 
that training and you you went to the Disney Institute and that's that's like uh, priceless training that you received yeah. and it's yeah. stuff that again it's priceless people would love to have that and you have that and it's so interesting that you're you're taking that model you're trying to bring it into to yeshivas to schools yeah I mean if you come to Cat's Day School in the morning you you're not going to be able to help but start dancing you just automatically dancing because there's, there's music blasting, and of course I bother Morty all the time. When, every day, when every day, and Morty Shap, how are you? Though? Yeah, shout out to Morty Shap. When his music is playing, I you know I hold the recording and I go <laughs> Morty Shap. Um, there's music playing. The, the teachers are out. They wear costumes based on different themes of the days and things that are going on. They're high fiving kids. The like, biggest complaint we have is why can't we get out of the car? You know, earlier than eight o five you know they, they're jumping to get out of the car uh from the secretary the receptionist to the bus driver to the lunch people to our amazing admin team and teachers they want to create a great experience not just a great um learning product but a great experience because nobody comes to a a, a open house and says i just want you to know we don't have the best math program we hope you work with us make it great we're doing our best, please work with us. <laughs> you know, everyone's gonna say they have the top of the line and they have fab labs and they have maker spaces and they have, you have to, otherwise you can't compete. So where do you separate yourself in the experience? And, and like there's that famous quote of, um, it's famous because it's famous, I don't know who said it though, um, but people don't remember what they made you, uh, what they taught you, they remember how, you, how they made you feel. Absolutely. People Absolutely. don't remember what you say. But, I remember how you, remember how you, you made, made them feel. feel. Thank if, you, you, if you talk to psychologists and psychiatrists and, 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 and social workers, everyone will tell you that when they have that um, patient, if you can call them a patient, sitting on that couch, whatever therapist's uh, office looks like, plants, soft music, I, I don't know, and, and, and they're hearing some horror stories from this person in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they, and, and, and they tell them, how, how did you do it? How, how are you alive today? I had a second grade teacher who believed in me. I had a seventh grade Rebbe. I had a social studies teacher who, who kept in touch with me. She used to write to me, she used to call me. She told me one day I'll be able to write. She told me if you wanna be a doctor, you can be. And they keep mentioning teachers. It's amazing. It's teachers, it's all about teachers. I think Torah Masora is running. There, yeah, uh, there's this new Torah Tor Masora campaign I called Sheer Hamilis. I saw it. And I saw it. they haven't do, they, they promoted it on, on our program and they, they asked me, could could you say a story of like a teacher of yours that like so I'm like thinking okay I've been in yeshiva's school for since uh, from, until I was 22 you know like yeah. I'm 28 now there's a lot of rebbeim I've had yeah. and I and I went back to like a rebbe I had in like sixth grade or even like a rebbe I had in seventh grade like yeah. Rabbi Yaron Harbatal who's like a, a legend and like again for us it was nothing it, it, I know we, I remember we were learning getting that that year. Um, but it was it was everything about how he made us feel and knowing what we needed and taking us on biking trips and nice. and like and, and you know what I, I bump into him today yeah. like in the white school Rabbi Howard will will come over to any of his students with the biggest smile on his face yeah. give you a kiss on the forehead doesn't matter if you're married with four kids nice. or if you're 17 years old yeah. and it's like that's special. Like what, that's, grade, what grade was that? That was in six, I was in sixth grade. Okay. I was that was my bar mitzvah year. So you're not going to remember a, a tosfos he taught you on an ordinary day, but you remember those things. Isn't that yeah. amazing? I don't is think our, I don't think our class was learning tosfos. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it it is. It really is. You should know. I, I've said this. Uh, I don't know if I ever said this on this program, but like I'm a firm believer in, in camp in general, and it sounds like you are. Yeah. You're making school that that have that camp vibe which is it's it's experience it's yeah. it's good it's happy but with rigor of you, course you, with that, you, you don't want to be known as a camp and kids are happy but they're not prepared for the world and they didn't get all the skills especially today analytical skills critical critical thinking skills yeah with especially with ai being an issue right now you want them to learn how to how to how to solve problems so you have to, you have to balance of course it. If that you want them to have an amazing education but but a great experience come out and say i loved school so people ask me how to gauge it so I got, I got two stories that I keep thinking about. So after Ian, which was destructive last year, we had another small hurricane that was coming and we were, we were gonna open up. You know, kids didn't know yet. We we're gonna send out an email saying that it's all good, we're good, we're gonna open up. So at, at dismissal, a third grade girl asked me, Rabbi Stig, are we, are we open tomorrow? So I thought I was gonna say yes and she'd say, all right, 
you know i said yes we're open tomorrow she said yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> I said, I, I don't believe what I'm seeing over here. I used to pray for storms, typhoons, <laughs> just let there not be plumbing in the school tomorrow so we don't have to go to school. And this kid's pumping her fist that we have school tomorrow. So that's how I gauge it. And then, you know, we had, <laughs> we had one of the kids who was horsing around in the bathroom and um, he decided it was a good idea to jump on, 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 the, on the sink and he hit the corner of, of the Formica, you know, in the bathroom and his whole knee opened up Aye. you know so there i am being called head of school you know come and see what's going on call 911 call out solo in the meantime someone's holding me up from fainting myself and um so the paramedics come and they say we, you know we got it we got to take to the hospital i said okay i call mom she goes i, I calmed her down i said you know he, he's good he's in a good place they bandage it up he'll be fine he's in a good place yeah <laughs> Yeah, so um, she goes, I'm an hour and a half away deep into Miami. I can't get there. Earlier saying that there's an hour and a half. So who has to go? Out of school. So I'm sitting in, in the ambulance with him. He goes, Rabbi City, how, how bad is it? I said, nah, a couple of stitches. You'll be, you'll be good. I'm, I said, oh, my God. So we get to the hospital, and the person who registers you in, not exactly a nurse, but, you know, they, they um, log you in explain what was going to happen first the nurse is going to see you then the doctor and we're waiting for your parents and then she turns to him and says son do you have uh, any questions for me he goes can i go to school tomorrow <laughs> so i said don't, don't, don't worry about school right now you know so then the nurse comes and the nurse asks a few questions and your parents are coming for now you're good the bleeding has stopped you know we're repairing you um son do you have any questions for us can, can i go to school tomorrow and then the doctor comes and he's done with his round and he asks again and he says doc please tell me i can go to school tomorrow he goes i heard this is all he's asking he says you you guys are running some school over there wow this kid is sitting with his knee busted open <laughs> and all he cares about is if he can go to school tomorrow so i use those things to gauge you know that i think our staff is doing an amazing job so what so like i guess tell us a little bit about that that special sauce because that is like a feeling and um, an environment that it's probably every parent's dream to be able you know, for their kids to be excited to be in school. So, yeah. what are some of the things that you think are unique and different that that your that your approach is? You know, kid, kids themselves know what they struggle with. Like we think we have to like you know let them know where their areas of of, of struggle is. They 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 know where they struggle. And when you kind of like again come down to their level and say, "Hey, buddy, I know you're struggling with this, and I'm here as a mentor." I'm here to be your coach and we're going to work this out together. You're going to be able to read, you'll be able to computate, you'll get through math. You know, I know that outside at recess, you're having some 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 trouble, you know, um, acclimating and, and kind of like um, socializing with the kids. I, I'm going to help you. That, that feeling of I have somebody here to take care of me, that feeling of we're here to teach you Torah and also help you develop a relationship with Hashem, which is what Ezra Academy did for me, which kids don't have today very difficult who has a relationship with Hashem we're very robotic yeah. you know unfortunately and a lot of great people like the people I mentioned are, are working on these things right so I, I think that kid kid goes home and they say it says Chumash is wonderful social studies is wonderful our teacher does fun things with us he takes us out to our garden and and shows us the new the new uh, cucumbers and 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 and, and, and um, eggplants that are coming out you get to do these things when you're in Florida, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know, when school is made fun, when school, um, when your teachers are mentors and not somebody who is looking to get you in trouble and to find your faults, that atmosphere is automatically uh, created. And proactively, we're doing something else to create that, and it's a pet peeve of mine. Something that I've been even working with other schools and educators um, is the idea of teaching children how to behave and not punishing them. So my, you know, my hero there was Dr. Ross Green. I think the book came out in 2008. Lost at school. It's a must, must for every educator. A lot of schools know about it. It's, I'm not being mechadish. So what Dr. Green kind of introduced to education was that we teach kids how to read. We teach them math. We teach them how to swim. But somehow we punish them when they can't behave. So we're very into teaching children how to take responsibility, identify they're lagging or lacking skills and now I'm, I'm here as a coach to help you correct those mistakes because it's good for you. Rabbi Noach used to tell me 
you know, he, he says, we used to stay as, as, a, as a teacher. It's now 15 minutes and I haven't started teaching. All right, I'll wait. It's 20 minutes. He goes, that kid doesn't care. That kid's looking at you and saying, you should open up a pizza shop. I don't care that you're a Rebbe. You should have been a pharmacist. I care that you can't start class. <laughs> so Rabbi used to say, teach them why it's good for them. Why is it good for you to be doing the right thing? I'm here. This benefit is for you for for a lifetime. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you a life skill over here. So there, there are great people out there, even after Dr. Ross Green, this guy, Larry Thompson, is very big now with RCD, respons Responsibility Center Discipline. Again, the theme is, why is it good for you? What's the benefit for you to behave? I'm here as a mentor and a coach to help you become a mensch. So yeah. that's a big theme in the school. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because we're in that period of time where, you know, like my parents or people whose parents are maybe 50, 60, you know, that age, they had a completely different 100%. upbringing and, and introduction to, you know, their education is more uh, maybe tough love and, yeah. and like, and, and it could be that those types of people or that age group could be a little bit, uh, uh, what's the word? Spect uh, sept uh, <laughs> skeptical, skeptical, <laughs> skeptical of of. Uh, thank you. I speak Nahi. <laughs> Could be a little, a little I'm bit skeptical. Up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a little skeptical. Uh, skeptical. <laughs> you got this, dude. You are crushing this. <laughs> Me and you together, we'll say it right. You got this. Um, of that, I'm not gonna say the word again. Of of that type of education, like no, we need the discipline. We need the you know the you know like. Do you think it's that ship has sailed? Like no no no, like that is not the right way. Yeah. Like your experience and you've experienced in YCQ and Hank and now in in Cats Hill Day School, like you've taught a lot of students and you're in charge of a lot of students. Yeah. Can you say with confidence that this is the new way and this is how it should be? Look, Nachi, maybe that, that worked back then. I don't know I, I, whether it suppressed them to behave because they were scared. Generally, punishment suppresses a child. You hold a trip over their head. You say you're going to be off the team. And you can't dis discard those amazing rebaim that were there at that time that people remember. Right. Not, God and it's nothing, nothing to their, no, nothing, nothing at all. Nothing at all. But as times change, you know, we need to figure out what they're going to respond to today. They're being held in school accountable for everything. We don't leave, let anything go. We're just there to make sure that we're able to help them rectify the issue where it's not just temporary, where we giving give them a skill life, going into yeshiva, college, marriage, and work, where they're able to you know continue being able to navigate life because of what they picked up. So, you know, um, those approaches today, I, I think would be, would be very dangerous. And I ha I've, had a, I've had a hill to climb. You, you think they were waiting for me with chocolates and roses when I've, when I've come with these approaches? You know, they see a kid, throw, you know, sent to my office and the kid comes out and they think we had a kumbaya. Like, you know, we had, we had, we had a lollipop together. It's not, it's not the case. Till today, kids will see my children and say, I know your Abba, Rabbi Sadiq. My, my kids say, from where? From his homage class? They go, no, from, from the Friday basketball club. So I, I was taught, you know, at least one class, and, and I taught at, at YCQ fifth grade Parsha. I taught them the greatest Rashis and amazing things. They, they don't remember that, but they remember we took the toughest kids on Fridays and we went downstairs to the gym and played basketball. In between that layup and jump shot, I'd have those talks that, that would penetrate because because they're, one of their principals took off his jacket and was playing ball with them. And I had to play hard, they're pretty good. <laughs> and, I, and I like to win, you know, I'm pretty competitive. So till today they see my kids and they say, your father's Friday basketball clubs. Wow, those were the days. Because, you know, I said, I wanna talk to you. I wanna come down to your level. I know you're hurting. I'm not here to judge you, I'm here to help you. How can I help you? So I think those approaches are gonna go a long way. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Two very, very important things I want to tell you right now. First of all, thank you for listening to this episode. And every single time that you're supporting one of our advertisers, you are directly supporting the Meaningful People podcast because they support us. And if you support them, you support us. So thank you so much for always trusting our advertisers, using them for business and donating to their campaigns. And the ones I want to talk about today are Shuvu and South Shore. Well, first of all, you know, Shuvu does such incredible work. The question really is for many in Israel, public school or yeshiva? 
Well, you can make the difference. 1,147 new children are starting in a Shuvu school this year, and they need your help. What that breakdown looks like is 189 new students in preschool, 550 new students in first grade, 245 new students in second to eighth grade, and 160 new students in high school. And you know what? Before I was talking to someone from Shuvu, and they said the average secular a teenager, you could start the, the sentence, the Pasuk, Shema Yisrael, and they will not be able to finish that. But Shuvu is helping these kids get back on the path of Yiddishkeit, which is an amazing, amazing thing. And they need $2.4 million to fill that budget gap. And they're doing that through a charity campaign that is charity.com forward slash Shuvu, charity.com forward slash Shuvu. They are changing the face of Eretz Yisrael. And you might think, well, you know what? Like those kids are not in my family and I don't really connect to that. But if you go to Eretz Yisrael, what Shuvu is doing for the kids there, for these kids that are going from public school to yeshivas, it changes the country. It changes Israel. It changes Eretz Yisrael. And you could be part of that. You could be part of that by heading to charity.com forward slash Shuvu. Shuvu has been around for an extremely, extremely long time. They have Haskana Spire, Shmuel Kamenetsky, Yeralia Burdini, Ruving Feinstein, plus more. And you want to make sure that you're supporting such an amazing organization. They have 67 schools with over 6,000 students. A big, big thank you to Shuvu for the work they do. And I want to mention one more of our friends today, and that is the Yeshiva of South Shore. Yeshiva was founded in 1927 in East New York. You know, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky sent his son, Rabbi Yama Kamenetsky, to the five towns in 1956 to open the first all-boys Yeshiva. Can you imagine? The first all-boys Yeshiva in the five towns. He took the rich Chinuch, Messiah, and he translated it here with a vision to reach every child with warmth. So many meaningful people, podcast guests, have gone to South Shore and they really enriched the entire community. How are you, Rabbi Leibowitz, right? Rabbi Ari Leibowitz, North Wimir. He went to Yeshiva South Shore. Until 2021, they have literally been in the original building that was built in 1963. They're right now, they're in the final month of building their new building. And now this is a building that is fit for Yeshiva like this. 16 new spacious classrooms, a bright and airy design wings with eight rooms for resources. This is going to be a very, very special building. They are right now in their last stage of finishing. They need to raise $1 million to finish. To make sure that they're able to move in after Sukkot, please, please consider supporting this mice. It's going to be quite epic when they move in right after Sukkot because they raise this money and you were a part of it. Hit the link in the description in the show notes of this episode. And thank you so much. Is this approach also for, let's say, I, I can see how this approach would work for the kid who maybe isn't, you know, excelling so much in, in academics and, and studies. But what about for the child that is a really good student and he's really good at math, he's great at Gemara. Is this approach one that will help him achieve more or will maybe hold them back? No, because those kids struggle in different ways. Those tr- those kids who are overachievers are, are holding back from doing things that they want to do they're not doing. And you're there to be a mentor and help them in that area. You know, they're stressed out and they, they, they put on a good face in school, but you know, you know, they go home and they're, and they're worrying about tests and, and getting those 99s and hundreds. So being a coach and, 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 and a mentor is, is is in every aspect, not just for the trouble kids. Uh, you know that's why in schools a lot of times we forget about those kids that excel and and they need to be challenged and, and we don't think about the struggles that they're going through. It's amazing that you brought it up. Cannot be ignored. You have to be in tune to those kids also. And and parents now call me and and, and they want to know how to implement implement this at home, which is of course much harder. I always say I could run over 100, 700 kids at school, it's the five at home that I can't handle, mm-hmm. um, you know, but it's been working at home as well. Again, for your benefit, we're not gonna do this because I love you and because I care about you. Mm-hmm. And they're gonna throw tantrums in school. You'll They go home at home, they're there. The tantrum can continue till three in the morning. But if you if you hold your ground because you love them, and you keep explaining to them, this is the best thing for you. And I'm doing this because I love you. Yeah. I love you. I think I think a fundamental theme in within what you're saying, which is resonating with me, <clears throat> pardon me, is that we have a limited amount of time that our children are in the school system. Yeah. And if we spend a lot of time during that limited period administering punishments, we 
in doing so, we fail to build a life skill that they can draw upon once they're no longer under our administration. Mm -hmm. Because our kids very quickly grow up and they become yeah. young adults. And then they are not always within systems that can administer punishments 100%. consistent with the values that we want them to espouse. Amazing. And if we build their skills at a foundational level, yeah. then they have those to flex and to utilize and to draw upon in their own adult life. 100% mama. It's a teacher you think to say, and I'm talking about myself. I, I like to consider myself a teacher above all. What about the consequences? He did this, he did that. What are the consequences? And seemingly, it, it seems like they're getting away with it. The greatest consequence is that he should fix it. <laughs> Natural consequence. Figure it out. This is not my issue. I, I've, I've had a great day. You know, I, 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 I've had a wonderful day. I'll tell you a great story. You know, the, <laughs> we had a custodian back at in, back in Hank. He was, he, was so, he was so beloved. He came uh, one day, he was in tears. Tears. You know, I said, what happened? Somebody's sick. He said, Rabbi, come on and show you something. He takes me to the bathroom. They destroyed it. They took paper towels, they made it wet, and they threw it all over the walls and ceilings and all that. Actually, there was some creativity to it. I saw some, <laughs> I saw some design possibly in there. Kid's blood was still on the sink. Yeah, I, I said, listen, go to my <laughs> go to my office, take a cake cup, you're off for the next half hour. You're off, out. So I found out who the kids were. How? Not for now. I, I came to him and said, hi guys, good morning. How's it going? I said, hey, good morning, how are you? I said, I'm great, I've had a great day. I, I heard you guys didn't have such a good day. And their heads fell. They know when I'm coming to them. They know already, I know the score. So I said, um, guys, do you know Do you know the name of the custodian in, in, in our school? They said, no. I said, his name is Omar and um, he's a great guy. You know, he lives in such and such a place. He's got a family. You know, he loves the school. Most nights he goes home, he has great stories to tell about school. Tonight he's not gonna have such a good story to tell. His only connection to learning Torah and Bible is us. And today's not a good day. So the kids said, um, what should we do? I said, I have no idea. I've had a great day. I've greeted every child as I do by first name when they come off, off the bus. I have did my three minute walkthroughs in class. I've had a wonderful morning, you haven't. So one of the kids said, I think that now we know his name. We should say good morning to him. Address him as not the custodian, as the person. I said, that's a good start. But the kids said, no, 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 before that, I think we need to go clean the bathroom. I said, great idea. Then the other kid said, you know, sometimes I see in the, in the lunchroom, they leave trays behind and he's overwhelmed. Maybe we can go and help. One by one, they started fixing the problem. And I cannot tell you the difference I saw in those kids since that day. Now, if I were to call up the parents and say, come pick up your kids. You know, we have this great custodian here. He's in tears. This is unacceptable. What kind of a, you know, what would I have gained over there? They would have gone home. They would have yelled at played Xbox the rest of the day, come back the next day with, with nothing to build on, nothing to build on. So I think we need to not let them get away with anything, hold them accountable for their own good, but be that mentor and that coach to help them to figure out how to, how to navigate it. And do you, yeah. Rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> do you find that these methods are, they need to be, I, I presume, a collaboration with parents to complement their parenting skills at home. 100%. Because it, 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 Chinuch, by definition, is a partnership between the parents and the school. And are you finding yeah. that this is sort of spilling over into the parent body? Yeah. 100%, because you, you can't kind of say, you know what, they're having a tough time. Let, let's just forget about them. And we'll take care of this in school. You're not going to succeed. You're not going to succeed. So we do keep in touch with them. I mean, I made a call home that day and I told those parents what I did with these boys. And they said, thank you. Why? Because I wanted them to know that I'm working with your children in this area. And it may come up at home that they leave their rooms like that. It may come up at home that they eat and they don't clean up after themselves. I wanna partner with you in that, that we're doing it in school and I want you to do it at home. Wow. We, we send notes and emails home all the time. They send notes and emails back to us. So Warby Parker style. Th there's, there's no other way to do this. There's no other way to do this. And you know, sometimes you get that irate parent that calls you where you have to hold the receiver over here. I've learned over the years they're hurting. And a lot of times they admit to me at the end, Rabbi Siddiq, it's just that I don't know what to do myself. I was like, wow, I, 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 I'm seeing it at home, maybe even worse. I took my frustration out on you. It's because I don't know what to do either. I said, okay, now we have somewhere to begin. 
now now we can do this together and and if the partnership is great you know you, you're going to see something amazing it takes a lot of patience on your end as well it's something that i can't imagine doing myself where you're in that situation with those kids and you know what the right answer is you know what they should be doing you know that they really should go clean the bathroom and they should do this and when they ask you well what do you think we should do the the you give them the the, the pesach to come up with it on their own and yeah. it's very easy for you to say well maybe you should clean the bathroom you know maybe go do that yeah but the fact that you you, you I'm, that's very calculated yeah yeah and what that does for the for the kids is like yeah. Yeah, there was a, in the 80s, there was a program, um, DARE, Drug Abuse Re Resistance Education. You know, the police and like, the, you know, um, all, all these organizations came in. And they wanted to stop drug abuse. You know, it was a complete failure. The, the great book, The Power Moments, brings it in there. It's, it's a phenomenal study on it. They were well-meaning. A lot of money was pumped into it, but it failed. Because everybody knew drugs wasn't good for you. You weren't machadish anything to these kids. Kids, I need you to know, don't do any drugs. <laughs> Thank you. They didn't know how to make good decisions. They were at a party and they didn't know to walk out. They went to a party and they didn't take a buddy with them. They were at a party and they didn't think that when I'm tempted, maybe it's time to call mom and dad. So they did a good job at scaring the living daylights out of those kids. But at the end it failed because they didn't work on helping these kids make better decisions doesn't teach them anything long term didn't teach didn't teach them anything 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 long term so at the end you know the whole thing fell apart so i think i read a study that when they shifted the messaging to just say no there was like a practical takeaway yeah so they got better at it but I, when i was growing up they came into our school even i didn't see any difference because yeah. okay so I, i'm 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 at a party like what do i do Nobody, nobody worked on that. No, yeah. nobody, nobody. I think a big yeah. theme that I'm hearing uh, when it comes to the education part here is it reminds me of a story when I was in when I was in camp. I I, f I feel like I've said it here before, maybe, but I'm not sure. Um, there was this kid that that got a solo during cantata, mm. and he gets up there in front of the entire camp, and he forgot the words. Wow! And like the air was sucked out of the room. His parents were there, I believe. And it's just like, oh my gosh, yeah. you could hear a pin drop because everyone, everyone wants, everyone, they want the kid to succeed. Sure. And, and the kid must have been like a 12 or 11. And you can't imagine the the pain or, or the embarrassment that that kid, right? And then I, I remember fast forwarding to the Camunk Circus, which was, let's say four weeks later, three weeks later. And I see this kid in the choir again. I'm like, no way. Like this kid's back in the choir? Are you kidding me? You get up, get up, get up on stage, and you forget the words to a solo. You're not gonna find me near anything that's wood. <laughs> I'm running away from anything in this stage at all. And he had a solo. Wow! And he nailed it. And I remember thinking, like, that kid's confidence is so much greater and so much better after now that he had failed and then he had stuck it out and went back to the choir again than it would have been before he failed for the first time oh, yeah. giving giving kids the ability yeah. and the space to mess up yeah make the mistake yeah even if it's inconvenient for for us as parents or teachers and say listen you got to get yourself out of this one yeah that is yeah. what i feel is like the greatest ability for growth, wouldn't you say? So Nachi, this is one of the greatest challenges we're dealing with. Rav Ephraim Goldberg just wrote an article, Mishbacha, it's time to, it's time to uh, retire the helicopters. We've been talking about this for years as educators at all, at all conferences and you know, it's innate, Hashem made us this way. I'm no better as a parent. In school, I give all the right, right talks and we should be resilient and grit, Angela Duckworth, grit, and you know, all that stuff. But when it comes to my own parents, thank God for my wife, you know, who always made me not pick up the phone and call the school. You know, for all those years, I had the class list like, like right in my hand. I could have put my kids in any class I wanted and made up the classes. My wife said, don't you dare, you know, let the teachers place them. And today, you know, I get calls from people. They say, or I say, what do I do? My son was dying to go to this university. He's finally there and he wants out. I go, what happened? He doesn't like, he doesn't like, he doesn't like his roommate. 
I go, okay, what did you do? We went to the dorm class. They said, we don't even have a sleeping bag, let alone another bed. His roommate is his roommate. So, and the mother was so transparent with me, said, this is all my fault because for years I called camp and I said he better have Jonathan, Yehuda, and David and not Max. No no, no offense to any Maxes out there. He, <laughs> he, he better have this, he better have that. And we called school and we said he better have more so-and-so, he better have so-and-so for general studies. He's fresher in the morning, so make sure he gets general studies and he gets math in the morning. Yeah. And we kind of did a disservice to our kids because all I hear from deans and professors and CEOs is that kids are failing life. And this kid got to the university that he wanted to go to but he, he, he wants to leave because he can't get along with his roommates. So it's hard, it's hard. At, at that moment, it's very difficult, but I think more and more we're talking about it now and more and more we're coaching parents. Yeah. They need coaching as well to don't worry about it. Let your son figure it out. Let your daughter figure it out. And our teachers yeah. are doing that. You know, when they get an email, they're getting used to saying, thank you, so-and-so, thank you, Mrs. So-and-so for reaching out to me. I needed to know this information. I'll, I'll take over. I got it. I'm going to handle it with your daughter. You know, and that the, requires trust, of course, between the parents and, and the institution. 100%. To 100%. let go of over-engineering the child's experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we mean, we mean well because the world became crazy very quickly. It became a very scary place. I'll just tell you a very quick story. Look, you know, my son at Hank, they would allow you to get on the team earlier. You know, you knew you were going to sit on the bench, but at least you'd learn the system and you were like a shoe in the next year. So, you know, my son, um, he was in fifth grade. There's not a good chance you'd make it. So he, he didn't make the, he didn't make the team. And um, it was hard because I had, you know, had a school, you know, pretty, pretty courageous of the coach. I give him a lot of credit because that's the way I want it. He came home and we, like he was sulking. And I said, listen, buddy, you got two choices. You can either come every day, drop your bag, go outside and take a hundred shots and do suicides and, and get ready for next year. I could just soak all day and, and that those are the choices you have. I came, I came home the next night and I'm hearing bang, bang, bang. So there's about 250 uh, dents in my garage door. <laughs> and uh, I wrote- I'm, I'm guessing it's hockey, not basketball. Yeah, because yeah, it's basketball, yeah, he's not it, doing it, the right it, thing. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's crazy. The whole world is crazy about yeah. hockey here. Not in Florida, but here. Yeah. So there's about 250 dents in my garage, which I'm very proud of. I look at them and I smile. I even wrote an article about it. I, I wrote my, my dented garage door. When I was run, learning, writing about grit and resiliency, I, I titled the article, my, my dented garage door. That's beautiful. Because I look at it and I say, he ended up, you know, going, he went, he went on to be co-captain of, of the hockey team and he's, he's, he's unbelievable. I, I could never keep up with him, you know, so. You know, there's like, yeah. um, when I, when I was younger, like 18, I went to EMT training. So yeah. I was an EMT for a few years. I'm not practicing in an ambulance or anything, but one of the things, um, they taught us was about if a, if a woman goes into labor. So it's, it's very chaotic. You know, nobody wants to be in a situation where you're in an ambulance the size of the length of this table and, you know, someone's giving birth. Well, what do you do? And I remember, you know, my instructor who has since, you know, passed on, his name was Gary Lava. He said, childbirth is one of the most natural things in the world. You just need to you know, be there and, and coach it through. And if everything is like, if there's no complications, like things will just happen. And it's like kids growing up, it seems like is also, it's a natural process. We just need to not mess it up. 100%. You know, we can't step in and, and like mm -hmm. just make the, you know, you mentioned that kid in college. Like mm -hmm. how many times does that repeat itself with, you know, I, I used to own a, a sports league in the five towns since I, I since sold it. But you know how many times me and my partner would look at each other and be like, you think we should like lock the door and not let parents come this week? <laughs> because we saw when parents came, it, yeah. it, not not the real parents. I'm a parent myself, but yeah. when parents came, yeah. things were way more intense. Yeah. My kids not getting enough playing time, and it was just like, and when the parents weren't there, the kids just they they, they made it work. 100%. They made it work. They're they're so much more resilient than we think, but the problem is it's hard to get from the head to the heart. They know it. They know that when they go to college, I'm not going to be able to call the professor, although they're trying. Yeah, I've heard from professors they're trying. They're getting messages from parents. They know it, but at that moment when their child is unhappy, 
at that moment when the child did not make the team, they just feel they have to jump in. They want to do anything. They, they want to do anything to get their child to be happy and not be disappointed. And your advice is don't. 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 Now, this doesn't mean don't ever call the school. You know, there are times that, you know, there are things you're seeing at home, you want to check in on him, you know, how's he doing at recess? Absolutely. And call the school as many times as you want. But at the end of the day, and again, I would not be good at this if not for my wife. She's just amazing at this. She just made my kids tough as nails because she said, let them figure it out. Let them just navigate life. For sure. And those who are doing it are doing a great job. And then I hear from executives and Google and, and, and these great companies that after seven months, they're leaving. The, the, the smallest encounter they have that's, that's difficult, they go, I don't need this job. Really? Like one of the executives at Google told me, like they should be pinching themselves, saying, holy Lord, I work for Google. All the stuff you see on TV, skateboarding to your office, <laughs> yeah. food everywhere. You're leaving us? You know, they, they, they don't have the tools. They never, they never received it. Yeah. Now what do you do? I want to highlight and emphasize a point yeah. that you made. Um, as, as a parent with kids in school, I don't think the messaging that we're hearing is don't call the school. I want to emphasize that point. It's, sure, it's absolutely. the role that the parents absolutely, have vis-a-vis -vis the school. Absolutely. And yeah. how do they participate in the process as opposed to um, directing that process from home? A hundred percent. I'm glad you brought it up again. Call the school, email the school. We need just partners. There's things you're picking up that we're not seeing. But at the end, let us be partners in this grit you know, um, in this grit kind of uh, project that we have to build resi resiliency in your kids. And uh, we can only do it together. And it's okay if they fail. It's okay. It's preferable. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, my son was fine in fifth grade. Yeah, he, he was okay. <laughs> That's Michael Jordan did and he got kicked off there the high school basketball team. Go, Every, everyone says it, but like yeah, yeah. actually happened. And what if his mom called him up and said, you're putting him back on that yeah, team? Like, yeah, imagine that. What would happen? No, who knows? The whole story would have been different, and I would be wearing. Maybe the next would win a championship. No, maybe I I wouldn't be wearing his sneakers. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, maybe uh, he wouldn't be making four hundred million dollars a year yeah. in royalties. Maybe you, you you just never. We're know. We're talking money because we know the Jewish parents are listening, and it's like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Rabbi Yaakov Sadiq, thank you so much. Course, you know, for for telling us your story. Sure. Um, it's, it's a remarkable one. It's really incredible. And Thank we you. appreciate all you do for, for your students and for Kali Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Meaningful People Podcast. Really, really appreciate it. And we're always, always, always welcome to hearing your feedback. And there's a couple of ways you can send it to us. You can send us a voicemail at speakpipe.com forward slash meaningful minute, up to 90 seconds. Tell us what you think. Maybe someone else you want to, you want to see on the podcast. Or you can send us an email right now, meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. I personally read every single email that is sent in. I also read all the reviews that are written about us on Apple Podcasts and all the comments left on YouTube. So, Thank you so much for watching this episode. Please rate, subscribe, and review. Rate, subscribe, and review. We really, really appreciate it. It helps more people find this podcast. And uh, we're just trying to spread the light over here. So thank you so much for listening to another episode. And we will see you again next week. And if I don't see you before Rosh Hashanah, I want to wish everybody a ksiva for If there's anything that I said that in any way insulted anybody, I hope you're Michael me. Feel free to call me personally. Uh, anyways, wishing everyone an amazing, amazing new year. It should be one of Hatzlacha, health, and happiness for everybody. Amen vi amen. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.